you have, there's a, an array of uh, images here that um, you, you, you said were like really special or hero kind of images. Did, yeah, Let, sure. Let's, you want to pick? We'll talk about a couple of them. Sure. Well, first with this one. This one here? It, yeah, because where we just this, were. Is, this is where Bonneville begins. The ones you just were looking at are 2018, but this is a picture I made in, in 1973 when I was hired by the people who, whose name is on that car, and that's the moment when I first experienced the, you know, the, that life. And, and the thrill to me about this picture is 2017, 18, whatever, somewhere in there, I started to wonder, I had said to the guy who drove this car, a guy, okay, understand, a guy got in this car and he drove it 266 miles an hour. In what year? 73. There's nothing there. There's a steel roll cage, you know, but if this car goes wrong in some kind of way, at two, I, this is part of what I wrote about in the story, in, in a heartbeat, in the space of a breath, you go three blocks. If the wind takes you and really pushes you off course and you begin to spin or whatever, you can be yes. dead so fast in this car. And they know that. This is not a daredevil act. This is an act of, of supreme trust in the people who have worked with them, helping them build a car, and the people who maintain the course and make sure that, that there is nothing, there isn't a tiny nail or anything anywhere because they can't see. They, they, they don't look straight ahead. They look at, at pylons on either side to judge where they are, and they travel 60 miles an hour is a mile a minute. These guys are going four and five times faster than that. So I looked and Al Teague is still alive. Huh. I said, Al, I, I call him, I said, Al, I promised I'd send you pictures in 73, I never did it. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I made you some prints, could I bring them down to He was so thrilled and I went down and we spent an <laughs> afternoon and I gave him some prints, and this is one of the prints that I gave him. And it, yeah. Real value in that. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so that business of, so yeah, one of the things that I think is really important, I don't know how many of you are photographers. <laughs> the, <laughs> now we so, know. Now so I'm, we know. So I'm just, <laughs> I am just probably speaking to the choir here. But, but we don't know the value of our pictures for 20 years at least. And that's why they're worth saving. That's why it's worth knowing where they are and how to put your hands on them. And, and why it's worth revisiting them is because we don't know until life has taken us a long ways down the road what's important. So that. Good point. Pick another one. Wavy. Wavy. So this is a, a portrait of Wavy Gravy. <coughs> I don't know, 10 years ago maybe, something like that. Um, I, I'm assuming most of you know who Wavy is. You know, he's a professional psychedelic clown. Wavy is a, you know, he's a deeply, you know, caring guy. Um, Humanitarian, he, you would. You but he never lets you see the real Wavy Gravy. He shows you the face, he shows you the the clown face, and if you go looking for pictures of Wavy online, I'm not saying they're not sensitive, I'm not saying they're not, you know, there are a lot of things, but they are never the guy. And so I, I shot this, I, I asked him to do a session, and I shot this one afternoon, and I thought I had done a good job, and his wife called me, and she said, Andy, she said, nobody has ever done this, this, I, I've never seen a picture of Wavy that you know, that is just him not being wavy gravy. So I'm really proud of that. Wow. And that's saying something, because I've got a million pictures of them. <laughs> and they're all close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's, you know, I, I have a lot of other pictures of wavy. There's none like that, you know? And, and if it was an accident, that would be a different thing. But I, this was a picture, you can see it in the, in the, in the roll as it goes. It's a picture that we come to this picture together mm -hmm. as I, I ask him to trust me over and over. Yeah. yeah. But just for contrast, there's John Cale. So 
I love this picture. I love <laughs> this picture because it's not the kind of picture I usually make. Yeah. You know, it's a... Uh, in, in what way? Like not eye contact or, I mean, like, um, is it that or...? It's partially that. It, it is. So John's another guy. I, John and I are friends. We've been friends for many, many years. And he is the most deeply, personally <clears throat> hidden guy I know. I don't mean, I mean as a friend, he's wonderful, but he's not a guy that, that reveals himself easily. And so when you shoot John Cale, what you get are John Cale pictures. And this in fact was for an album shoot. And, and it was, you know, the ones that we used are very, very different. But twice during the course of this shoot, I, I tried hard to break away from that and to make a picture where this is a, I, I don't know how much you know, you know, if you like John's music or, you know, he's one of the founders of the Velvet Underground and he's, a, you know, he's, he's as old as I am, he's 82 and he's still creating music every single day. He's, he is my personal hero as a, as an artist who continues to do the work. And, and you cannot, you're not gonna see that in his eyes, <laughs> but I got him to do that. Yeah. Studio? Made up studio, yeah. Co couple of lights. Okay. You know? um, a lot of grain in here really adds to the whole conscious choice, I mean, obviously. It's always a conscious choice if it happens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, of course, of course. What it's else? The, the first thing you learn in the movie business is, is you're, some, you're a young assistant camera person and the cinematographer, if you get to go into dailies, the first thing the cinematographer says to you is, I don't want to hear a word from you about <laughs> oh God or anything like that because whatever shows up on that screen, we meant to be that way. <laughs> I got to ask you about this one. Sure. Oh! <laughs> this is called Random Baby. <laughs> and in honest truth, I now have to say, I don't know that I shot it or Darcy shot it. Did you shoot it? Yeah, it's Darcy. <laughs> That's, that's what happens after 50 years. You didn't give her the assistant talk, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I love this picture. But it's, yeah, it's, and, and, and why I love this picture is because it reminds me how accidental it can be. We don't have to always know. And just sometimes the world gives you the most wonderful shit. And you just, all you got to do is push the button. Well, but you got to be prepared. You got to be ready to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What else have we got here? Do you want to talk a little more about Nick? Sure. That, that's such an interesting... <sighs> yeah. So uh, we've talked before about access being like one of the most important things for any photographer. Yes. So how are you in this room? <laughs> it's in the book. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we'll move on and uh, <laughs> warm up the cash register. <laughs> I, um, so I was living in L.A., and I was kind of scuffling along in the movie business. And Wavy Gravy called me, because by that time I had already lived on the hog farm bus, and all that kind of stuff. And Wavy calls me. He says, Andy, do you know who Nick Ray is? I said, no, nah, I don't know. He says, well, he's a really famous filmmaker, and you should know him. He said, and, and he's working on editing a picture. Um, and he's at the Chateau Marmont. Um, and he really needs some speed. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got any speed? And I said, Yeah, I got a jug of drugs. So, so I went over to you know to give Nick some some drugs. And this is this is the interior of the bungalow at the Chateau Marmont where Nick had years before uh, prepared to direct Rebel Without a Cause. But this is not Rebel Without a Cause. This is actually the last picture he worked on called We Can't Go Home Again. And what's happened by now is Nick has hopelessly fucked up um, and, and he has been given a, a job teaching young filmmakers in somewhere in New York or something. And, and he, the first thing, you know, he takes this class and he says to them, 
I can't teach you how to make films in a classroom. We have to make a film. I'll show you how it's done. And in a couple of months, he turned them into this mad unit that they, they were shooting a thing that was intended to be seen on, it was like seven overlapping images and, <laughs> and they were shooting it, there was multiple strands of storyline and then they had to edit it and so they, and oh, and where the money was gonna come from to do all this was, this film was invited because Nick Ray is a god in France, was, it, this was invited to play at Cannes. So Nick takes all the kids and, and says, we'll go to the chateau. He goes to the chateau, says, you remember me, Nick Ray. You know, I did Rebel Without a Cause here. I'd like that bungalow again. Doesn't mention he has no money. And, <laughs> and so they give him the bungalow. He moves all the kids in and they start editing these strands of film, now overlapping them on a, a large projection screen. They got six or seven, seven uh, 16 millimeter, maybe even eight millimeter projectors. And, and Nick, you know, they would rouse him from his toper because he would be, he, would, he was drinking a ton of wine and, and then taking enough speed to keep moving. <laughs> and, and they would, we would run everything. And, you know, and, and amazingly, he would say, all right, that one, you know, you gotta shorten that up and, 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 and would give them directions for the, for the next piece of the editing. And they were all 18 years old and could not in any way, you know, control him or, or, or make him do anything. And I'm 30 or 35 and fearless for no good reason. And I can say, Nick, we gotta get out of here. Nick, you're making a scene. Come on, man, let's go. And sometimes he would listen to me. So I got to hang close with Nick for the time that he was in town. And, Did he ever find his pants? <laughs> he was in no rush. <laughs> he was very proud of that bikini underwear. And I have film of him dressed just like that. Do you guys, if you know the Chateau Marmont, it's a you know, fabled hotel in, in Los Angeles. I have a film of, of Nick walking up the stairs outside the Chateau dressed exactly <laughs> like this as the college kids. Come on, Nick, come back. <laughs> We could go. Is there one more? Because um, I want to get to your other two little films. Oh, short okay. Films, so. Kansas. Kansas. Yeah. So this is Kansas. This is so. This is why it's necessary to write stories. Um, I think this is a good picture. I mean, I'm very proud of this picture. I don't mean in any way to say this is not a fine picture. This is the last Pony Express station still standing. It's in a field in Kansas. Nobody ever sees it this way. If you go look for pictures of it online, the pictures are all made from the other side. Um, I was really taken the day that I was taken there. I was really like, that's important. This is stuff that's really important and it's, it's still there. And I came around and I found this place and I said, it needs, because this, is a, this place stood in prairie. There was no grass. This was all prairie, and this is prairie in the foreground, so I crouched down. What I'm saying is this is an intentional picture. I made this picture with, with thought and care, and it's everything that I could make of that at that moment. But it doesn't tell you the story. And that's why I tell stories, hmm. is because the combination of this and the stories I get to tell, I think it makes a bigger thing. 